Hey, I'm Ron Rodos, and welcome to our journey through the Real Book number 207. Yes, the 207th out of the 400 tunes in the Real Book volume 1. I'm using the C edition, of course, on piano. And uh, this is Lazy Bird by John Coltrane. And we're going to take the same approach that we've taken in all the others so far. It's basically having a jazz piano lesson that uh, actually deals with the tune and the context and how to approach it. Not just the notes on the page or the chords uh, in a small way, but in a way that gets into the cultural context of the tune, which is really what jazz is about, right? It's about understanding where this stuff comes from and what we can do with it. Uh, how we can bring our own approach, our individual approach, to a tune that a lot of other people play. And of course, John Coltrane. What are you going to do after John Coltrane? Well, you can't play it better in Coltrane's way than Coltrane. And if we uh, compare ourselves to that, we'll always fall flat, right? I mean, that, that's, a, that, that's a fool's game, right? And that's what most of us are playing. We're playing, oh, it doesn't sound like Coltrane, doesn't sound like Coltrane, doesn't sound like Coltrane, or as good as Coltrane, or as good as my neighbor, or as good as that, uh, you know, 15-year-old I heard last week, if you're older than 15, right? You hear some people just playing on their sax or piano, playing everything, right? So how do we play it at our, quote, best? How do we get to know the tune? in a way that we can play it in our way. Because if we play it in our way, we're not competing with anybody and they can't compete with us, right? That's not what music's about either. So we have to get rid of all that, all that baggage, all that garbage, all that stuff, and just let it, let it sort of dissolve. Okay, so 1958. Uh, quick quiz. What is the significance of 1958? Let me put it another way. What happened just after 1958 that 1958 is leading up to? Well, 1959 was the year that produced Kind of Blue, John Coltrane's Giant Steps, uh, Ornette Coleman's The Shape of Things to Come, uh, Mingus, uh, all, all these great musicians had something in 1959, breakthrough a year. Uh, but what happened uh, right before that? Well, we're leading up to that in a way. Historically, in, in historical hindsight, the album Blue Train by John Coltrane, great album in, it, um, in itself. It's kind of leading up to that, that pinnacle of giant steps the next year. Uh, and this is not an approach that Coltrane stayed with forever. So we have to remember that too. You know, all these um, really difficult chord changes. He sort of abandoned that after a while. It was too hard for everybody. But we look at Lazy Bird, the first time we look at it, everybody probably has the same reaction. Oh my goodness. How am I going to play through all these different chords that seemingly uh, don't, don't have any much relation to one another? Or at least these tonal centers that don't have relation to one another. So we're in G, and then we go to B flat, and now we're in E flat, we're back to G, and then what's this B flat 7 in there, or B flat diminished later on? It, it's just crazy. And not only how are we going to play that, how are we going to play it at 1, 2, one, two 3, 4, right? So we go through phases with a tune like this. We probably just struggle, 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 and all the um, uh, seemingly random chord changes or at least abrupt changes of tonality are a hindrance to our free expression because we can play well in the key of G, say. Well, I can do that. But how do I play in G and then get to B flat? Ooh, that didn't really sound that good, and it kind of worked in terms of the scale or the chords, but it wasn't the melody I was hearing in my head, and so we go through a long period of time like that. We sort of struggle, struggle. It's not quite what we want it to be, but hopefully having fun at the same time. And then at a certain point, something shifts, and we can do it. And it, oh, I can do this. Okay. Melodic sequence on this tune. Boy, when I was Jerry Mulligan's assistant in 87, 88, I used to, you know, well, how old was I? In my mid-20s. Uh, I used to listen to him play concert night after night in his tours of Europe. I'd be sitting at the soundboard, kind of helping with the mixing. And uh, I would hear him play melodic sequences like that on everything. I'm thinking, wow, will I ever be able to do that? It sounds so good. And without even trying. I just did it on a, one of the hardest tunes in the real book. So if I can do it, you can do it. But it takes time for the soup to simmer. It takes years, decades. I probably played this tune when I was 16 or 17 for the first time and had no clue, no no clue, no clue at all. And now it starts to feel natural. So it feels natural, that's the second stage. And then, 
third stage is really where the, um, uh, the chord changes become a help we can, uh, they help us express ourselves in new ways because, hey, if I'm just playing in G all the time, maybe I start repeating myself a lot and, or, or uh, in a way that I don't like. It's okay to repeat ourselves, but um, it's becoming a little stale. Or I want a new challenge, so I'm like, oh, well, okay. So, okay, oh, that sort of helps me heighten the intensity of the line as it goes up from one key to another. It sort of gives me... Um, uh, it, it spurs my creativity or, or allows me to say something in a way that, um, that I like that I might not be able to say if I'm improvising on the same chords all the time. So we have this arc in our own personal journey that can relate to a tune like this. So um, uh, the other thing is that it's fast. It's fast. We don't always have to play it as fast as Coltrane, right? That was Coltrane. Also, he's playing, you know, 20 hours a day, right? And that's all he's doing is working on a tune like this for, for a year at a time or something with, with some of these tunes, working the chords out at the piano, sitting, playing them slow over and over and over and over again. And uh, if we don't have 20 hours a day to practice like he did or whatever he did, um, you know, it doesn't matter if we can play it that fast or not. We can play it at what tempo is comfortable for us. Bill Evans didn't play fast after he left Miles Davis and had Miles counting off tunes really fast. Bill Evans preferred slower to mid tempos. Keith Jarrett, who can play at fast tempos in his, in his prime, he, um, he often preferred to play at mid, middle to slower swing tempos, occasionally fast, but, um, but that was his preference, right? These medium tempo tunes like Stella by Starlight were in a way his forte. Um, so uh, Lazy Bird, let's just get right into it. Um, it's uh, obliquely based on the tune Lady Bird by Tad Dameron. If you want to read a little more about that, Lewis Porter's excellent biography of John Coltrane has some analysis. But basically, uh, Lady Bird, which would have been a tune that Coltrane would have known, it was on the bebop scene, uh, started out with two measures of C major 7, then went to, in bar 3, F minor 7 to B flat 7, which are the chords Coltrane has here in bars 3 and 4. He doesn't have the C7 for two measures, but he has, starts on A minor, which is related to C major, relative minor, and then he goes to C minor, which is the parallel minor of C major. So in a way, that's just one way that this could be obliquely based or inspired by Lady Bird. Certainly the title seems like it, right? Lady Bird, Lazy Bird. So um, I'm just gonna find um, an energetic uh, tempo that uh, seems right for me, that I can sustain and that I can, sus uh, that I can express myself within, and, um, and just uh, go for it. This is <laughs> Playing a tune like this, it's sort of like you're on a roller coaster and it's going up slowly and just when you start, that's okay, it's going down. Here we go. No stopping now.
You know, it's interesting where musical influences come from. And um, as I was playing that ending and I was doing those sort of arpeggios where it's, it's sort of getting, you know, a little slower and, and he's building these up, upward slow harp-like arpeggios. Um, I don't know, it just flashed in my mind this album by Duke Ellington called Unknown Session, which is one of the great albums and it's fairly unknown. Um, it was a small group recording and Ellington does it. I forget the name of the tune, Tonight I Shall Sleep or one, one of those um, uh, um, sort of older kind of maybe uh, tunes that kind of sounds like spirituals or gospel music um, with a little blues influence. He does that. He plays these arpeggios and it kind of flashed in my mind right, right there. And that's an album I listened to a lot, uh, especially when I was in my 20s. I used to listen to that probably every day. It's one of the great, great, great feelings. It's sort of like a kind of blue where there's this mellow feeling on the whole album and they just, they just click and lock in together. Um, small group recording by Ellington. I don't think it was released in his lifetime. That was why it was called Unknown Session. But I could be wrong on that one from the early 60s. Um, but the influence came there and ending on this nice sharp 11, it says in the real book. Uh, it's a great tune. Have fun. Listen to the Coltrane version hundreds of times if you want to listen to, if you want to learn this tune. Absorb it. Try to scat sing along with it a little bit. Uh, absorb the music. Be like a sponge soaking it up. And then just woodshed. Woodshed on a tune like this and eventually you'll go through that learning curve or that, that um, assimilation curve where you're assimilating the music and making it your own. You can express yourself through this rather than feeling like you're struggling at all times. It will happen. You got to stay with it and enjoy the journey. That's the main thing. Enjoy the journey so you can let the music flow. That's why I always say enjoy the journey and let the music flow. They go hand in hand. Good luck with your music and um, thanks for being here. Next time we check, oh, this is <laughs> Lazy River. Great Louis Armstrong uh, feature. Uh, Hoagie Carmichael. Um, great. How many tunes begin with Lazy other than Lady Bird, Lazy Bird and Lazy River? Um, thanks for being here. I'll see you then.